Uh, very, very good evening, everyone, and welcome to No Thrombosis Program. Uh, you know, No Thrombosis Program, it is, today we are on 14th doing it for you know, thrombosis. It is a really proud moment for us. You know, the almost 44th program we have conducted. And uh, that is all because of uh, you know, the Giriam Matsar supports and all of our delegates and faculties, you know, as well as our moderator, Prabhakar Sir, Gil Sir supports. We have completed the, uh, almost the uh, 44th program today. At the same time, we have also received you know, uh, this, uh, you know, the best, most engaging scientific platform award from by any pharma company, by Sims Healthcare Excellence Award. So, you know, I am very proud and very to introduce our uh, today's course directors, none other than, you know, Dr. Srimad Sir. So, Dr. Srimad Sir is uh, the director in Cast Lab of Ruby Hall, Pune. And uh, the Sir is uh, was the president of CSI during in 2017. He's also convener in National International Council of India at CSI 2004-2006. And uh, proprietary intervention cardiologist and has given live courses across the globe. Though coronary interventions at the heart, you know, he equally adapt at the peripheral artery intervention, you know, like, you know, leg, you know, catroid, and as well as aorta, and participated in some of the groundbreaking trials. So, sir was associated since, since the beginning of no thrombosis. No thrombosis is the childbirth of, you know, Dr. Giremar. So, once again, from behalf of I want to welcome to Dr. Sridish Giremar. And our second, uh, um, or first is Dr. Girish Nosundani, sir. He is the director in cath lab and senior international cardiologist from Apollo Hospital from back. He performed more than 4,000 angiograms to femoral and radial and ulvar approach. As well, he is the first cardiologist to implant, you know, absorb your strength in sectors. And also, also, he is the first cardiologist to implant MRI compatible AS LED system in the state of Karnataka. And first cardiologist to implant, you know, Tapping coronary strain in the state of Karnataka. So, once again, from behalf of NPR, I welcome to Dr. Girish Nosundani, sir. And our most beloved uh, moderator, Dr. B. Prabhakar, sir. Uh, Dr. B. Prabhakar, sir, is the treasurer of CSI 2022 from Chennai. Dr. Prabhakar is senior consultant and international cardiologist associated with Apollo First Med Hospital and Ashwin Clinic, Chennai. Sir, as you know, assistant professor of cardiology in Madras Medical College, Chennai, during 1998 2002. Sir, in you know, many international and national conferences as faculty, as well as you know, he's published many articles in reputed journals and also uh, many landmark trials. He will work as a principal investigator. So, once again, from behalf of MQ, welcome Prabhakar sir for this program. And uh, today's speaker, Dr. Sajid Kishan, he is an international cardiologist from you know, GSL Hospital Rajamundri. Welcome, uh, Dr. Sajid Kishan, for today's program. Uh, second speaker is Dr. Rahul D. Agarwal, sir. He is the international cardiologist, uh, you know, uh, from, you know, Andhra the hospital from MRC Ahmednagar. So, from behalf of MQR, I welcome to Dr. Rahul Agarwal, sir, for today's program. Welcome, sir. Welcome, Rahul, sir. So, today's our uh, agenda, the first case will be presented by Dr. Sajid Kishan. He is from Rajamundri. Uh, and second case will be presented by Dr. Rahul D. Agarwal from Ahmednagar. So, uh, with this, you know, I will hand over the sessions to our uh, uh, Dr. Shiri Shrivan, sir. Sir, over to you, sir. So, good evening, everybody. Uh, uh, Mr. Ravi, we are ready to go, are we? Yes. Yes. Sir. yes. So, we will request Dr. Sajid Krishna uh, to give his presentation. Yes. Uh, then we'll have Dr. Rahul Agarwal from Nagar. And then we have one more slot left if uh, uh, Dr. Prabhakar or Dr. Uh, Girish wants to present, they could go ahead. Otherwise, I have a case ready as a, a third, third option. I think we should put the one that you put on the WhatsApp Academy last uh, couple of days back. <laughs> uh, it's too... Uh, I mean, I don't think I am ready with that, but... Uh, let me just, by the time one hour goes in first two presentations. Everything is fine, sir. Nothing is fine. I think your case is always evoked a lot of interest. Let's be, see. Let, let's so, see what Sajid has to say, sir. Yes. Sajid, can we request you to present your case, Sajid? Yes, yes. yes. So, Sajid, you are in which city? I am uh, practicing uh, in rural Rajmundri, sir, in a place called Rajanagaram. Rajmundri? Yes, 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 sir. This is in uh, Mysore? Uh, Karnataka. Andhra, sir. Andhra. Huh. Yes, yes, sir. Okay. So, 
So good evening, everyone. Good evening, uh, Hiramat sir. Uh, good evening, Prabhakar sir, and all uh, the listeners. Uh, so I'm Dr. G. Sajit Kishan. I'm a practicing cardiologist from uh, Rajamandri, and I practice in uh, GSL Medical College, uh, Rajanagaram. It's a rural uh, part of Rajamandri. And my topic for discussion is uh, catheter-directed thrombolysis and uh, peripheral vascular interventions when affordability in beach advances. So uh, first of all, warm uh, greetings from our uh, coastal Andhra. And uh, I thank the MQR team for giving me this opportunity to present uh, in front of stalwarts like Hiramat sir. Uh, so so uh, once when uh, MQR team is approached, I uh, didn't have any interesting cases uh, to present. But still, uh, any case in cardiology uh, is of interest and uh, there is nothing like an interesting case. Uh, so I thought I'll present a topic which is less discussed that is catheter-directed thrombolysis. So me practicing in a uh, rural part of India, the problem with interventional cardiology is despite all the advances, always the problem is economic hindrance and uh, uh, because of that, we are not able to completely rely on the latest uh, advancements. And cardiology treatment is heavily reliant on uh, government welfare schemes. So that's why you have difficulty in doing image-guided procedures and costly hardware and catheters and so on. So uh, coming to my topic, uh, catheter-directed thrombolysis and introduction, it's a treatment modality in acute and uh, subacute occlusions of the lower extremity arteries uh, having salvageable uh, limb ischemia, which are uh, class one and class two A. It's an adjuvant therapy uh, in, in endovascular interventions for uh, chronic occlusions. And uh, also in many studies involving catheter-directed thrombolysis, we have even class two B ischemia where uh, catheter-directed thrombolysis is Perform and uh, the main limiting factor is major uh, bleeding complications that can occur. So this was the classification uh, proposed uh, by the style investigators in uh, 1996, uh, where category one is viable limb, category two is a threatened limb, two A is marginally threatened, and two B is immediately thre threatened, and uh, three is uh, irreversible disease. So uh, uh, class three normally we go for amputation or any surgery, salvage surgery, and uh, uh, one and uh, two A we normally consider catheter that is thrombolysis, and two B is normally surgery that is considered. Uh, I mean, uh, conference now, but you're coming tomorrow. Right? Uh, the main you're limitation coming. with uh, catheter directed thrombolysis is and that there are large variation yeah. treatment protocols. And we are ready for you. Have right. been uh, conducted and the techniques and the regimens are heterogeneous. And okay. to this day, there is no consensus on the optimal fibrinolytic agent or dose regimens to use. And there's no proper literature on usage of STK uh, and uh, the protocols involved. So coming to my case, uh, my case is a 29-year-old male patient. He's a lorry driver. He's a heavy smoker, alcoholic. He came with complaints of pain and swelling in the left lower limb since four days and decreased sensation of the left foot since last two days. So on examination, vitals were stable. Local examination of the left uh, lower limb showed tenderness below the knee. Sensations decreased over the ankle joint and the foot. Uh, peripheral pulses below the uh, femoral were all absent. Left lower limb temperature was colder than the right. Discoloration of the skin was present on the dorsum of the foot. And uh, rest of the systemic examination was normal. Uh, investigations, uh, the routine blood investigations were within normal limits. ECG echo was normal. Virals were normally echo. Arterial Doppler uh, showed long segment left iliac and popliteal artery thrombus and no flow in tibial and below knee arteries. And a CT angiogram of the left lower limb uh, showed complete luminal thrombus in the left uh, common iliac, internal and external iliac, distal SFA, popliteal and distal ADA. And there was normal contrast or perspicuous to the right side. So the diagnosis was acute thrombotic limb ischemia, category 2B. So the two options for me was uh, surgery, open uh, thromboembolectomy versus uh, endovascular therapy. So the issues were, uh, as uh, told, it was affordability issues. Patient didn't have any government scheme enrolled and there was also no, no availability of surgeon at, at that point of time. Uh, but the idea was to save the limb because the person was the sole breadwinner for the family. So all we could do is motivate them for the expense of an angiogram. So we opted to go for an endovascular therapy and went ahead with an angiogram. So this was the peripheral angiogram which was done, uh, which showed occlusion of uh, the left common iliac. So uh, after that, we have used, uh, we have taken a uh, retrograde puncture of the femoral in the contralateral side and uh, used a JR to take the shot, uh, which showed left common iliac total occlusion. Then we passed across the lesion with a thermo wire and uh, did 
a balloon angioplasty uh, all along the length till the SFA with an 8, 8 mm uh, semi compliant balloon. So, after uh, doing a balloon angioplasty, we found this uh, still some significant thrombus in the distal SFA, profunda, and uh, below. So, we again went for a balloon angioplasty for the left uh, SFA with an 8 mm balloon. Still, in spite of that, uh, there was a very poor flow and there was extensive thrombus burden. So with this th thrombus burden, uh, we didn't do, not getting a good result with balloon and plastic. Uh, we then thought we would go ahead with the uh, catheter directed to the thrombolysis. The patient was a young guy, 29 year old. So we thought there are no major contraindications for thrombolysis. So CTT was planned. Uh, then again, over here, the problem was uh, affordable tissues regarding thrombus infusion catheter, mechanical thrombectomy devices, or thrombus suction catheters. So what we could do is put a simple five French pigtail uh, and uh, uh, change, uh, make small holes and uh, convert it to a multi site hole catheter for use. So with this, we went ahead. And as such, there were no standard methods for catheter directed thrombolysis uh, regarding the agent and the dose, uh, but several delivery methods that were described were continuous infusion, bolus, uh, pulse spray, graded infusion, and stepwise infusion. Currently, the simplest and most commonly performed is a continuous infusion. Uh, and the most common used agents are alteplase, retiplase, and tenecteplase. And again, the affordability issue uh, comes into part. So we had to take the age old uh, drug, which is uh, the cheapest of all, uh, streptokinase. So we used uh, injection streptokinase, 1.5 lakh bolus followed by an injection, uh, continuous infusion of one lakh units per hour. I think mo most of the literature also does not uh, encourage use of SPK, but because of affordability issues, this was the only option uh, left for us. So uh, we have done, uh, we have started the catheter-directed thrombolysis and uh, the shot after 16 hours showed some flow improvement, but still there was a remnant thrombus in the distal SFA and the popliteal. So then we again went ahead with uh, thrombolysis for 24 hours. Then after 36 hours, this was the, the common iliac was fine. The internal iliac still there was some re uh, remnant thrombus. And uh, this was the flow of the distal SF SFA. Distal FSFA, SFA was fine. Profunda femoris also, there was some sluggish flow, but it was patent. Complete opened up and some residual thrombus in the pillar. So the procedure went on well, patient was stable, no bleeding complication, and patient was just an antiplatelet and not an antiplatelet. So uh, this uh, was the limb after a two, two week follow up, and patient was doing well, and his pain is completely reduced. There was a pro thrombotic workup planned for uh, the patient after three months. So my second case was a 39 year old male, smoker, non-hypertensive, non-diabetic, referred from CT surgeon uh, himself with complaints of right lower limb pain and ulceration of the great toes in 10 days. Uh, his left lower limb pulse, pulsations, femorals and popliteals were well felt. Uh, uh, DP and PTA were uh, slightly reduced and uh, right lower limb pulses, so only femorals were felt and rest all were absent and syst systemic examination was normal. So all the investigations routinely done were normal and Doppler showed acute thrombus of SFA, popliteal, ATA, PTA, and thrombocytosis PDs. And uh, the diagnosis was acute limb ischemia. So this patient in fact was referred from the CT surgeon himself uh, because of affordability issues. He was, uh, the patient was not even uh, affordable to get a CT done. So we had to again convince him for an angiogram uh, and patient was directly taken for a con conventional uh, angiogram plus revascularization. So again, a contralateral puncture, uh, a retrograde uh, puncture was taken of the femoral and JR was passed and uh, we've taken a shot. The upper uh, uh, CIA, EIA and uh, internal iliac were all normal. Proximal SFA was fine. Then there was thrombus, 100% occlusion in the distal SFA. So we have uh, went ahead with a balloon angioplasty with an 8mm balloon. 
and uh, result we could get some faint flow however there was extensive thrombus burden still present again for the same, uh, this patient also we applied the same strategy of using a modified uh, infusion catheter and uh, did uh, stk thrombolysis at 1 lakh units per hour continuous for 24 hours and uh, after 24 hours of stk infusion this uh, was the flow we could get we could get a very good flow uh, complete clearance of thrombus and a very below knee uh, artery flow also present patient was stable post procedure and discharge an antiplatelets and long term anticoagulation so uh, concluding remarks both cases were not technically challenging ones but uh, rather economic challenges surgery though a first line option was not performed uh, due to cost constraints and uh, catheter directed thrombolysis is safe and a very cost effective uh, alternative to surgery in acute limb ischemia patients with low risk of bleeding and some points for discussion uh, as no good literature is available uh, i would uh, be uh, welcoming some inputs of experience from uh, stalwarts on stk usage and maximum duration to when it can safely be given and inputs of experience on cost effective prothrombotic workup and realistic long term treatment approaches in these patients with poor socio economic strata thank you sir dr sajid uh, very good presentation Uh, did you do a sort of uh, uh, post uh, uh, establishment of a forward flow uh, uh, workup as to why they got thrombus? I mean, the truck driver probably sits in one place for a long hour, so maybe uh, that could be positional with some kind of uh, thrombotic tendency. But uh, did the uh, uh, evaluation reveal anything positive in these cases? no we have we have just got the routine investigations done sir and ecg echo and all but nothing it was a thrombotic occlusion but we could not get a cause but to go, go for a more detailed thrombotic workup the issue was cost so respectively we have planned after 3 months to get it done but we'll have to see how much affordability the patient will be having sir so patient has now on warfarin plus uh, dual antiplatelet dual antiplatelet yes yes warfarin aspirin is not enough i mean you must have something else in addition to warfarin aspirin what and uh, clopidogrel sir we have put on triple that thing initially so yeah but i am asking you whether warfarin aspirin is alone maybe dr prabhakar or dr girish can help us uh sajit actually a very good very good cases i think what you have done is an excellent job i think you have uh, you have made use of the available resources and salvage both the limbs that itself is a great thing first i should appreciate you on that and what uh, dr uh, hiramat sir is asking you is both these patients need a workup on the why they are so thrombophilic now yes, yes, if you yes. want to do the thrombophilia package the point with thrombophilia is they have to be done at the initial onset before you give the heparin or you have what like what you say after 3 months but there and you have to withdraw the anticoagulation and check it up mm -hmm. because all these things are going to interfere with your protein c protein s and antithrombin c <clears throat> now that is going to be a very important factor in long term anticoagulation both these days most probably will require an long term anticoagulation another thing you have to ask these guys is any family history of this mm -hmm. because i do have families with the uh, antithrombotic uh, and uh, thrombotic episodes like i've had a girl who had a pregnancy induced of uh, postpartum uh, pulmonary embolism thrombolysis second day after lscs because the surgeon said don't worry do it i'm good thrombolysis she became all right then after about 10 years there's a guy who came to my clinic and said he had a breathlessness had a pulmonary embolism i told him by over phone now we'll do this and he said okay i was surprised why he was saying okay to me and i tell to him on the phone then it turned out that he was that fellow that lady sister then when he went back and looked it turns out that their father also had a dvt and this fellow when i worked him up he had an antithrombin 3 deficiency now he is on long term anticoagulation till one year ago he stopped the treatment and now again he is got a dvt is about two weeks ago so you have to be looking at family history also which works out very well because long term anticoagulation is a very interesting aspect that you have to be looking at now as far as this case is concerned my question is all these 
venous thromboembolisms, they are all thrombotic. Antiplatelet agents, what is the role of antiplatelets in that? I'm not very sure about what is the role of antiplatelet agents in these drugs. Or, or is it related to your, your uh, doing an angioplasty with the, with the balloon? I, I'm, because to my knowledge, all these cases generally require only anticoagulation. Because uh, we still uh, think that it could be uh, atherosclerosis and a plaque rupture. Uh, could it At be? 28 years? Yes, sir, because we see a lot of cases with premature CAD, sir, in our area. Indeed, I totally agree with you. But in that case, have you done a coronary artery calcium score or shown atherosclerosis anywhere? Because it's most probably a de novo arterial thrombosis clinically. It's a classical case wherein you suspect a congenital problem and you have to do a thrombophilia workup. Atherosclerosis, and, and mind you, you must also remember, by adding an antiplatelet agent, you are increasing the risk of bleed considerably. Okay. I, I'm sure there is no data on this, but the second point is, why warfarin? Cost-wise, actually, warfarin is expensive because you need monitoring. You can probably, the, the best data is probably with the, with the rivaroxaban 20 milligram. Probably give rivaroxaban 20 milligram, that's going to be cheap and good, because nowadays it costs about 15, 20 bucks, you can give it. So I think I think that will be a reasonable approach on on this particular case. As far as the antiplatelet agent, I think you have to be a little cautious on this. I don't think there is any guidance on any deep vein thrombosis being treated with antiplatelet agents, and I don't think there is any data on that. And you have something, please tell us and educate us. Yes, sir. Nothing like that because only thing I thought it was associated uh, atherosclerosis, premature atherosclerosis. That's why I put on uh, triple therapy. I thought I'll downgrade and probably do a workup later. Agreed, Sajid. Sajid, probably, probably your justification for uh, uh, dual uh, or dual thromb thrombotic therapy in that sense, like a dual pathway inhibition, as we call it nowadays, with especially a higher dose, not the 2.5 milligram twice a day. Probably because these guys are going to be low risk for bleed. Both your patients are young patients, so they may tolerate it, and you will get away with it. But generally, in principle, for a for a thrombosis of this this magnitude. I would expect more of a thrombotic occlusion where an anticoagulation is going to be um, uh, more beneficial in these group of patients. But, but antiplatelet, yes, maybe yes. And uh, Dr. Hiramat sir says that what is the role of dual antiplatelet therapy? I think when you add dual antiplatelet therapy, the risk of bleed becomes more. Mm -hmm. So in that case, if you're thinking of thrombosis, um, atherothrombotic disease still, I think it's fair enough to give a single antiplatelet agent and uh, antithrombotic uh, with anticoagulation. I think that's a, that's, that's a fair enough uh, composition. But as far as the this thing, the uh, the anticoagulation that you have given in the limb, you have done a catheter directed thrombolysis. What happens? You have crossed and gone below. Now, as a coronary interventionist, would you would you have thought about going in, putting in a micro catheter there, and seeing a flow there, and probably giving in the thrombolytic therapy distal to it? <laughs> especially in the first case, especially in the first case, not the second case. No, no. Even the second case, the catheter just looks into the right iliac artery. Uh, so maybe it's about a couple of inches into the right iliac artery. Okay. Did you try getting into a thrombus and give intralesional, intrathrombotic? Uh, yeah, yes, sir. Yes, sir. So we have uh, actually placed the catheter. We have made multiple side holes and placed it at the lesion itself, sir. But while taking an angiogram, we have pulled back and did an angiogram all, all along. But uh, the infusion was done exactly at the lesion only. The only reason for the first case I had to pull it a little up is because even profunda was occluded. There was thrombus even in the profunda. So I had to pull it uh, up and uh, place it for some time so that even uh, the profunda gets uh, the STK. I think finally the profunda was also open, if I remember right. Yes, yes. The still, uh, it has opened, but still there was slow flow in it. So. These um, uh, cat lab workup. Uh, you do on DSA or you do on a regular CNA? Uh, on, on regular only, sir. We don't use much of DSA owing to the radiation hazard, sir. Otherwise, if it, if it is a chronic occlusion, probably we would have considered a DSA to see for the collateral flow everything. But uh, for this case, because both were acute, so I had not gone for a DSA as well, sir. All right. Dr. Girish is around. Any comments from him? Uh, my apologies, sir. I just joined in a little late. I uh, just had to finish a case. Okay. Maybe. Sir, I'll give you a summary. Girish, sir, I'll give you a short summary. He has specific Please. cases of uh, peripheral arterial occlusion from the iliac mm -hmm. now. And uh, both okay. the cases, he has given catheter-directed streptokinase. 
Okay. And uh, first case was reasonable results, but the patient symptomatically improved. Both limbs were salvaged. Uh, second okay. case, the, and the angiographic results also look fantastic. And uh, the two Dr. discussions... Dr. Provaker, I think had... we'll take Girish's input, more inputs on the next case and yeah. not sort of repeat the whole story. Okay, okay, okay. Let's go to the next case. 30 minutes in. Go ahead, sir. Thank you. Thank you. So, we are now inviting Dr... Uh, Dr. Agrawal or Agarwal? Agrawal, sir. Rahul Agrawal. Uh, but you are spelling it as R A R A A G R A, correct? R A H U L A G R A W A L. Uh, Agrawal. All right. We look forward to your case. Thank you, sir. Just like my previous colleague, uh, I work in a sort of a semi-rural setup. And uh, for us, to the reality of day-to-day -day practice is government schemes and cost constraints. I think the difference between big cities and the smaller cities come in the financial part. And I present a case of acute dyspnea. A 36-year-old male who had history of free fever three days for three days. History of recent travel to a crowded place present. And he also had history of cuff. There was no history of any chest pain. There was no significant past history. No hypertension, no diabetes, no congenital heart disease and no history of asthma. And he had no history of any provocating factors for DVT. No bed rest, no thigh pain or swelling. Uh, he was vaccinated for COVID. And he was not under any treatment for any COVID disease or any tuberculosis in the past. On examination, he had tachycardia and tachypnea and was hypoxic with saturation 91% on boom air. Normal blood pressure was present and uh, everything else in the systemic examination was normal. He was fully conscious oriented. The systemic examination was normal for all practical purposes. He was admitted to ICU. A presumptive diagnosis was kept as a low respiratory tract infection and query a COVID pneumonia. ECG shows few changes. That's why I got involved into the case. The chest x-ray done was normal. We did echocardiogram on the first day itself after rapid antigen test was done, which was negative for COVID virus. And it showed a dilated right atrium and ventricle, mild tricuspid regurgitation and a severe pulmonary hypertension with a PA pressure of 70 mm of Hg. So immediately he was suspected to have a pulmonary embolism and a CT angiogram was done. So this was his ECG done in the ICU. Uh, after he had settled down a bit, so tachycardia has settled, but we can see a deep T inversion in the V1 and V2 lids. Other signs, classical signs are absent. Go for a CT scan. You can see, this is a film of the CT scan. I'll show the images later. There is a thrombus in both pulmonary arteries. We can see a large thrombus over here. The dilated RA and RV. The black, black colored thrombus present in both the pulmonary arteries is seen clearly. In a zoomed up image, we can see that in the peripheral branches, both side thrombus was present. So the city report we get, got it at very late hours of the night. We also got his lab done and which shows a normal complete hemogram. ABG showed mild hypoxia. Uh, other parameters are mostly normal except for a troponin T which came out to be positive and a D-dimer of a very high value, 8791. So otherwise everything was okay. He was started on basic supportive treatment and uh, we were uh, gradually deciding his further course of our action. Next day, early morning, he started deteriorating rapidly and he developed uh, uh, hypotension requiring noradrenaline support and he also started desaturating which required a high flow O2 and later a BiPAP. 
he was given an option for aspiration thrombectomy and shifting to a higher center in pune or mumbai which he refused due to lack of money so we put him in the uh, scheme government scheme and uh, decision to thrombolyze was taken so instead of streptokinase we used uh, urokinase for the patient he received a complete full dose of urokinase for 12 hours following which he stabilized remarkably he became comfortable there was reduced o2 and ionotropic support and clinical picture remarkably improved we were doing close follow up and uh, daily echo and everything was being done on the day 4 of echocardiogram this was the first echo we done after thrombolysis it showed a pa pressure of 50 so reduction in pa pressure and there was no clot this is on day 4 bedside echocardiography and we showed a mobile thrombus in the right atrium it is crossing it is almost a clot in migration and a very very large clot was seen i'll show it again this ball almost a ball of thrombus big mass of thrombus was seen in the right atrium right ventricle almost extending into the pulmonary artery surprisingly he was clinically quite stable at this time at that time we had cvts surgeon available at our campus we took an opinion and he advised a surgical embolectomy because the patient was young and the thrombus mass was very very large it was explained to the patient and the relatives they were, they were actually not well. so affording and they refused surgery we also had a hematologist available so we took his opinion uh, we told him that he was already on heparin and had been thrombolyzed still he insisted on doing a complete thrombophilia profile so it was sent patient uh, refused surgery so instead of low molecular deparent we stepped it up with a unfractionated deparent infusion 1000 unit per hour with apdt monitoring venous doppler was repeated and it showed a right lower limb partial recanalized and fragments seen in the internal iliac and ivc some thrombus were present there also this is a repeat doppler done later on further course the patient gradually improved with heparin therapy he echo showed resolution of thrombus i don't have the images but he gradually reduced in the next 48 hours we stopped the iv heparin and shifted him to oral anticoagulation with rivaroxaban 15 mg of bid day 7 he was moved off all the support and day 8 we received the thrombophilia profile while he was in the ward so it showed a oh, surprisingly a homocysteine level of greater than 50 a b12 deficiency was also there and he was a strict vegetarian other than that protein s deficiency was present protein c was normal factor l5 leading mutation was absent ana negative and a anker negative this was a complete ana blot done done on request of a hematologist and it was negative for almost all the parameters the homocysteine levels were markedly elevated of greater than 50 the lupus anticoagulation or anticoagulant was absent patient was discharged on day 10 on rivaroxaban 15 mg bd homocheck bd and other supportive treatment he is on regular follow up doing remarkably well mobile and has reduced resumed his job he is currently on rivaroxaban right lower limb doppler was done later on after 14 days which showed a very good resolving thrombus so thank you this was my case in short hiramat sir you are muted uh, i was asking how are you treating his hyperhomocysteinemia uh i have started him homocheck that 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 is the one 
I give it as a combination of I pyridoxine, B12, no, and no. folic acid. Can you tell us what dose is required and how how much uh, of that is there in uh, homotrek? I think it's a very small dose that you give in homotrek. So I would probably feel the dose required is much much more. Okay. Doctor Girish, your comments since the, we missed you on the first case. Very. Yes, sir. Uh, I also agree. Um, you know, it just depends on how they respond. Normally, there are two or three bands. Five, five milligram folic acid twice daily. You can give. One more check, or there's another one called NCBM sixty nine. That's what my hematologist prescribes. We wait for about a month and see if the homocysteine levels fall below twenty. If it does not, then we tend to double. Sir, actually, actually, there is only one small study on uh, these homocysteine levels and post uh, and interventions. What happens when you give something? What happens? Study is post PCA study where homocysteine levels are high, and that is the dose which is actually given in this homocheck capsule. So apart from that, there is not much of any solid data on giving us a specific dose for uh, uh, homocysteine levels, treating homocysteine levels. And what he is giving is homocysteine homocheck capsule twice a day. That I think is the standard dose that is recommended in the particular study. I can't get the name of the study offhand. I'll try to get you, uh, which is a post PCA study that was there. Apart from that, there is nothing much on uh, the homocysteine levels. And uh, this particular case, I don't know. I, I I'm not sure about the protein C protein protein S was deficient, correct? Protein, protein S, was, S was deficient. Protein S was deficient. Now, but he was already on heparin. That that is the exactly. problem. So you can't really comment on that at this point of time. And uh, what would be your long term implication? On this protein as deficiency, what is your long-term plan for this particular patient, Doctor Prabhakar? What are you suggesting when, whenever you're suspecting any thrombus anywhere, you pick up a sample and then start working on the case? Is that correct? Exactly, sir. The first sample when you do, you send it for the thrombophilia package. Correct. Before you I give think all of us must remember that once you treat them with all kind of uh, blood thinners the reliability of the thrombophilia package goes down. Yeah. And uh, then uh, you are struggling for a long, long time, how long to continue, what should be the dose and those kind of things. So uh, first pick up a sample, send it for thrombophilia package, and then continue to work on, on these kind of cases. But anyway, uh, Dr. Agrawal, what is your plan? Uh, you think this dose of Homocheck one OD is going to be adequate, or you would like to try what Dr. Girish suggested? Yeah, I, I've already put him on twice a day. Twice a day, and uh, he uh, he also received IV B12 while he was hospitalized. I think he received three doses of that because his vitamin B12 were also coming low in the study. So we I corrected that factor what I could. Uh, other than that, I have started it twice daily. Okay. I may also increase it. I have, I, I have not read the literature, but I will increase the dose if the panel suggests. Uh, regarding the long term, what I plan to do is that once he becomes stable, then uh, maybe a three months later, stop his uh, anticoagulation and again refer him to hematologist and uh, recheck that protein S part, uh, whether it is really there or was it just a heparin effect. I think it's worthwhile to look for whether. It was, you know, non-provoked or a provoked DVT and pulmonary embolism. Means if there's any history of any injury, long travels or dehydration, um, something like that, then you know you you have a definite cause for it. And at the end of six months, you may have to stop, need not continue. But if there is, it's a totally unprovoked. Uh, no malignancy, then you really need to look up why did he develop such a massive uh, clot burden? And uh, another pulmonary embolism, you know, these people, 50% of them will have another pulmonary embolism in the coming year to two. So it's not a very innocuous thing. He will need a lot of your attention. Yeah, definitely. Uh, uh, it was a totally unprovoked one. Just that uh, on detailed history, he had a history of travel. But uh, I would not say that he traveled for a very long distance or a Long immobilization was there. Uh, it was a short travel only. But what I feel ki it may be a sort of a post-COVID sort of a picture. The, what I feel. 
because crp levels were elevated even when the uh, rapid antigen test was negative it could be a post covid event what 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 i feel dr agarwal what dr girish sir is suggesting is very very important for his long term outlook now one is you are suspecting covid fine but the point is if you are going to have a proteinase deficiency that is suspected it's going to be a little tricky for you to diagnose it later because you have to withdraw the anticoagulation for a period of about 2 weeks yeah. and then do the proteinase levels again and if you find that the proteinase levels are low then you have to anticoagulation and that 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 there's a very interesting point there also if you're going to anticoagulate him there are two kinds of anticoagulation long term that is described one is with 20 mg rivaroxaban another one is 10 mg rivaroxaban both are described 20 is supposed to be slightly superior but 10 is fair enough what i do is i have patients with protein c protein s antithrombin 3 deficiency three different kinds of patients i have all of them i tell them exactly what dr girish said there is a 40 to 50% chance of recurrence which is very high so when you have a 40 to 50% chance of recurrence you explain to them you are not you don't have to really put them you explain to them it's a it's a conscious decision combined decision that is discussed with the patient if the patient is willing for it put them on long term anticoagulation and they're going to continue it for life no no one minute doc, dr prabhakar uh, your dose of rivaroxaban you are suggesting only 10 mg or 15 mg sir the dose recommended during the initial phase what he has given is for the first 21 days 15 mg twice a day Absolutely. after 21 21 days it becomes 20 mg once a day and rivaroxaban has to be given along with food not before after yes. food absorption is actually better with food That's so true. you give it after 21 days you give it for three months after three months if you decide on long term anticoagulation there is data for both 20 and 10 mg all my patients i put on 10 mg and so far none of them have recovered mm -hmm. except the guy who stopped the anticoagulation so yes what i feel yes. ki considering yes. sk is he would be better off on lifelong anticoagulation yes the, the, See, the point is the... you need you need some justification on that yeah Because definitely you want to put him on a lifelong anticoagulation you need some evidence to tell him that he's going to require it. because if he bleeds he's going to sue you yeah but uh, it's also true that if he gets another pulmonary embolism even then he's going to sue you <laughs> so sir, it's that's why so, sir it's a combined so, decision so combined decision and a correct dose correct, i would sir. probably send all of them on uh, 20 mg long term especially young people who are sir, only... there is there is enough data on 10 mg sir it is also a same class of recommendation as 20 mg sir i can i, I i'm sure if agarwal looks into it he'll be able to get the reference because i i have checked up and then put these oh, patients on oh, 10 mg but interestingly the long term oh, anticoagulation oh, is really not studied much in the protein c and protein s oh, deficiency oh, category yeah, definitely that that that's Actually, what point. i feel sir na ki this thrombophilia profile and all workups we are doing much more nowadays in the past not many people were very serious about it what 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 i feel matlab it was actually very expensive the cost has come down nowadays uh, still once the patient becomes better a lot of them got lo get lost to follow what what i feel yeah i think uh, i think in that that case i think to be fair enough to say that if you have an unprovoked pulmonary embolism discuss with the patient like what dr grish says and put them on long term anticoagulation is probably the safest if you don't have if you can't do a proper thrombophilia workup that i think is the safest option but like you say you, it has to be a combined decision with the family and this thing clearly document the risk of bleed because nowadays documentation has become very important i'm sure yeah, you have something to add on this no i see we have a moral responsibility to do what is scientifically correct uh, whatever it costs whether patient does or not document on your prescription and tell him this is required please go to a government facility if you cannot pay for it and get it done we try and do it here if they can't afford it at a private clinic we'll send them to government place and give a very strong recommendation for letter again the best thing to do is probably after 6 months rather than end of 3 months and having evidence of you know significant uh, pulmonary hypertension has resolved do another venous doppler if it permits uh get another ct pulmonary angiogram to know that there is no obliteration of the pulmonary vessels you know honeycomb all that gives you some idea what will be his future vulnerability for a severe pulmonary artery hypertension or a recurrent pulmonary embolism leading to chronic carpal pulmonary 
So I think these are a few things that in a young person you need to follow up to. I think I think both Sajit and uh, Agarwal's cases are uh, some kind of a problem where wherein you have an unprovoked thrombosis and classical cases of some kind of a thrombophilic uh, uh, a milieu that is happening inside. And I so think what will you do? Long term anticoagulation? I think so, sir. Unprovoked arterial thrombosis is very very rare unless there is clear atherosclerosis. And if you have an atherosclerotic thrombotic disease, antiplatelet therapy is going to work. How are you going to differentiate that? Is a very difficult point to prove. Uh, talking about CRP and uh, and uh, COVID, that is another interesting point because you really don't know whether this guy has got COVID. Maybe you could have done the IgM, IgG, but like you said, cost is a major factor in, in rural India and getting the test done is also going to be difficult. Better to anticoagulate for three months, look at it. And uh, Dr. Dr. Grish says echo is going to be fairly simple nowadays. It's going to be easy. There's no pulmonary apprehension. Probably recheck only the protein S at that time because you had the problem only with protein S. I am, I am doing his echo every month. I am doing it complimentary for him. And his PA pressure is going down. Matlab, he's, now it's on, uh, in the mid-40s. So, and he, you know, he had done his doctor also. the duration of the anticoagulation. I mean, PA pressure going down is a good news, but doesn't help you to decide how long you should go with uh, anticoagulation. I think uh, all these protein S, etc. are required to decide how long you should uh, continue. Difference. There are going to be long-term risk for division. In the first six months after your uh, oral anticoagulation, if there is no worsening of pulmonary hypertension, another recurrent event, only at the end of six months, you can consider stopping it for 15 days after documenting that there is no fresh thrombus in the veins uh, on a DVT. Okay. And do another thorough hemophilia checkup. And if there is absolutely no identifiable cause, then you would probably think it as it's a provoked or you could say COVID or whatever. If you think there is something abnormal, then automatically it becomes a lifelong anticoagulation. All right. Do we have any third case or shall I present one case? Uh, all right, with everybody's permission, I'll present one case. It's about, uh, what time is it? 8.50. So we have time for one uh, case. Uh, Dr. Prabhakar or Dr. Girish, you want to present any case? Because I presented it last time. You go ahead. Uh, next, probably next time we'll arrange for something. Okay. Yeah, right. I wish they had told me in advance. At least a day advance, I would have picked up something. In the meantime, I'll try to cook up. There is one particular data on which... Uh, which uh, anticoagulation interferes with which uh, protein C or protein S. I I'll try to fish out that slide when by the time you finish your presentation, sir. No, for next uh, meeting of MQ, uh, you must show us that. Huh? Sure, sir. Sure, sir. All right. So actually, we have this uh, gentleman uh, who had uh, a left main thrombus. Uh, his presentation was quite dramatic, intense chest pain, profuse sweating, and gross ST changes. And uh, we uh, sort of took him up to cath lab uh, and this was what we could see. Uh, so some thrombus at the left main proximal area and distal vessels are quite nice and clean. So this was a sort of a 50 gentleman with no risk factor. And this is the uh, 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 thing which we would have loved to do imaging because apart from thrombus, there could be a flap in the uh, left main, uh, which uh, would give a similar presentation. So flows in the LED appear clearly slow and you have something going wrong in the left main. Uh, so what are, what are the possible options this, at this stage? You, know? you give intracoronary lysis, Dr. Prabhakar or Girish or Dr. Sajid or Dr. Agarwal, anyone could uh, give their opinion. So this was the image that we are seeing in the cath lab. So we, we, we lice or we stent. Sir, my choice for I this. I think, uh, go ahead, sir, go ahead, sir. Girish, sir, no, go no, ahead. Please, sir. I think. This is a very dangerous uh, place, you know. Uh, 
uh, if you have a failed thrombosis it could be catastrophic but i think it's safer to do a pcr after this, imaging this gentleman was very young uh, something like late 30s and had no risk factors Uh, so this was weighing on our mind, and we thought we will uh, give him a lysis. There were some other cases. Uh, uh, so this was another case where an inferior infarction. And on uh, day one after cath lab, we could establish some flow, but a lot of sticky material in the RCA, and we did not uh, uh, stent him. we gave a tyrofibran for next two days and this is what you see a uh, uh, reasonably good flow so no balloon no aspiration and just a uh, uh, tyrofibran uh, could give us this kind of result so this was at the back of our mind uh, and uh, uh, but then we are dealing with a left main case uh, this was another case uh, where we have a thrombotic occlusion a uh, th- uh, thrombotic narrowing of the left vein again a very young individual and uh, uh, a thrombus there uh, and uh, uh, as we were talking with the family what are our possible options he had a cardiac arrest and this is the uh, uh, trouble and we could not uh, salvage him uh, in this uh, peripheral hospital so uh, this was another case uh, where we have uh, uh, non st mi patient was reasonably stable and uh, we had this thrombus at the mouth of the left vein and in this case there is a lesion in the distality with the extension into circumflex and uh, uh, and lad uh, so this uh, case was uh, my uh, uh, colleague cardiologist and he preferred a bypass surgery on this right hand case uh, and even in both cases were sent for surgery so this is our case and uh, blood pressure was borderline we thought we must have a good close and that's why we uh, maintained him on ibp despite a reasonable blood pressure uh then we uh, uh, did a thrombus aspiration and uh, i don't think uh, you are seeing too much of benefit with thrombus aspiration though uh, this uh, aspiration could have been done with the guide catheter itself i mean it's so close to the thrombus that uh, you probably don't need to put in another aspiration catheter so we did that uh, but probably did a uh, Uh, aspiration with the aspiration catheter also and uh, these are some of our uh, thrombotic cases you can see a, a vein graft uh, um, it was a 8 or 10 year old graft and uh, uh, but short story and you see how deep we have taken the guide catheter it is all the way down almost to the junction of the vein graft with the right coronary artery so this was taken over a uh, balloon protection uh, like a wire and balloon inflated and then the catheter was slipped in and you can see uh, after some good work we can see a beautiful flow in the uh, uh, venous thrombus so these are some things which we don't think of routinely but thrombus is a ball game and Uh, even if you are about 30 40 years into uh, cardiology practice every thrombotic case will teach you something different uh, so this was totally unexpected uh, a vein graft which was occluded uh, and looking so brilliant at the end of this uh, so this is back to our case uh, 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 thrombus aspiration was done tyrofibran was given in the in the coronary and uh, 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 i mean still whatever was there in the left main you can still see uh, unfortunately in this lab we had no imaging facility but even that could have been of great help to decide whether there is a dissection of the left main 
the uh, uh, patient had multiple aspiration, looking slightly better. Thrombus load appears much less uh, in this particular image. And this patient, uh, uh, we thought we'll check after 48 hours of tyrofibra and heparin combination. Uh, uh, and this is how uh, uh, the uh, uh, thrombus looked smaller. Uh, yet, I think imaging would have told us whether to stent or not to stent. But uh, in this cath lab, we had no imaging. I was in a peripheral lab. And so we decided that safer to stent looking at the uh, location uh, right at the beginning of the left main. So this was a, a stent. I thought it was in a reasonable, reasonably good position. This is a uh, close to AP, uh, shallow RAO, and this is a uh, LAO cranial. I use these two angles to make sure that you are in a uh, uh, good osteal location and always have some catheter floating into the aorta. You can see the stent uh, 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 clearly uh, covering the ostium and floating into the aorta. And uh, uh, then it is inflated, you see the waist, uh, you pull back the same balloon, go high on pressure. And uh, so despite taking all this care, this is how we are uh, looking. Uh, uh, the uh, orange color is the stent and the blue is the vessel. And uh, we could see something which is going down like this, you can see better here. And uh, uh, this view sort of tells me that we are not at the ostium. I mean, the catheter, the stent is not covering the ostium. Uh, I think we are reasonably sure that we have missed the ostium. And as I told you, there was no imaging possible. And we have a very good experience about overall left main stenting. And uh, 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 Dr. Uh, Mark Silvestri, uh, has been um, uh, our guiding force in doing more and more left main. So uh, we we said we'll go ahead. This is the second time after 48 hours of tyrofibran, uh, we decided we'll go ahead with the stenting. Uh, we have a reasonable length before the bifurcation, and we thought we will limit ourselves uh, only to left main and not hit the uh, bifurcation and block the um, uh, origin of the circumflex or LED for that matter. So our wire is in LED, we are in a spider view. And uh, this is the uh, 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 deployed stent. And in spider view, it looks good. You can see it looks good, but in uh, LAO cranial view, which was the view in which we actually uh, positioned our stent. Uh, the stent seems to have missed the ostium. I think most of you would agree that uh, there is a clear gap between the uh, origin of the uh, left main and the origin of the uh, left main stent. So uh, 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 this was better seen in LAO cranial. So aleocranial is a view I'm suggesting we should all check again and again for left main osteal stent. Uh, you can take a AP cranial also or a shadow RAO cranial uh, to get your uh, stent at the exact uh, left main ostium. So then we uh, sort of, uh, we had almost uh, decided uh, we are, uh, we have missed the ostium. And also we had uh, dilated the ostium, believing that we have covered uh, the ostium with a metal half balloon floating outside to go high on pressure. So we had obviously damaged the left main ostium. And uh, uh, we thought we'll put one more stent uh, 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 in this location. So the flows are looking good at this time. Uh, patient was quite stable, but uh, uh, see here, uh, we are very unhappy with the osteal uh, position. 
Now, whether to put one more stent or no was an uh, issue, but uh, we thought we'll put another stent. So this was another stent which was placed at the ostium. And it was post dilated with an NC balloon 4.5. Uh, this patient actually went home uh, and was on uh, dual antiplatelet therapy and, uh, uh, and uh, oral anticoagulation. And one month later, he came back with uh, severe chest pain, gross ST depressions, and uh, uh, hypotension. And you can see everything wrong with whatever we had done. Uh, the uh, stent has got clot. The clot is extending into the proximal uh, or osseal LAD as well as the circumflex. So the entire left circulation looks uh, uh, very, very difficult. Fortunately, the blood pressure was reasonable, though there was a lot of tachycardia and heart was struggling. Uh, uh, so we uh, decided we'll put one more stent because we have some reasonable experience. Uh, this is uh, another case uh, where we have a left main uh, distality, uh, distal, mid and distal half of left main is showing a critical narrowing with hardly any flow to circumflex as well as LAD. So this was stented and at this time we have put taken a stent into proximal LAD. And this established a good flow. You can see heart briskly contracting. So everything worked in this case with one stand towards LAD. So this is our past experience. Uh, and in this particular case, we uh, put a balloon pump uh, because uh, there was hypotension and we are dealing with a very critical area. Um, uh, and uh, the both LED and circumflex OM were wired. And multiple aspirations were done. Uh, so patient has a balloon pump, two wire in place, aspirations done. That is the story so far. And uh, we thought we probably need to stent uh, more towards LED and accept some compromised circumflex. The circumflex also had a sizable circulation. So this is the time we thought we will we must get the ostium correct. So this is our favorite view: the uh, shallow LAO and steep cranial, or you could do a small RAO, five or ten degrees with cranial view. And this shows a good stand position. We're obviously not very concerned about the circumflex flow at this stage uh, because it's probably uh, the first stent is not across the mouth of the circumflex. So there was no sort of concern that there would be two layer of stent at the mouth of circumflex. So, so this was a four into 28 length uh, stent which was deployed. Um, uh, so we are covering the earlier one month old stent and we are covering the circumflex ostium going well beyond the ostium into proximal LAD. And this was a 4.5 NC dilatation at high pressure covering the um, uh, ostium. Uh, we of course use a stent boost when we are doing this position. And this time, of course, we are very confident that we have got the ostium correct. So we will make the stent float out and do a high pressure inflation. So part of the balloon is uh, uh, outside into aorta, part at the ostium. And when we want to withdraw this balloon, this is a point I want to make that uh, the guide stent is at the ostial location. If you push the guide only on the wire, it could hurt the deployed stent at the ostium. So generally, we get the guide close to the deployed stent with the balloon inside so that uh, the uh, guide catheter and balloon are sort of aligned towards the vessel and it doesn't hurt the deployed stent at the ostium. So this is a care we take and this is the final result we have. Uh, good flow, 
towards LED right from the Orsham. This time we have not missed the Orsham. You can see Orsham very well covered. And fortunately for us, the flows to the circumflex are also going, going well. So we didn't have to do anything special to the circumflex flow. Uh, so uh, on these occasions, you should probably take uh, choose a stent, which would be very friendly with the side branch. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, there's no time. So uh, if you have an occlusion of the side branch, uh, like in this case, circumflex after putting left mint to LED stent, and you spend about 10 minutes trying to rewire and establish flow, a, a lot of harm could be done. So uh, this is an on extent, uh, keeping a flow uh, well to the side branch. And uh, this is the final result. So issues here are, why did the patient have uh, thrombosis? I mean, the main was stented, the first one, the stent ended before the origin of the circumflex. Uh, and as I discussed, probably we missed the osseum and had inflated high pressure balloon, 4.5, going to very high pressure. And that probably was the reason for the thrombus. But it took good one month. I mean, the patient was home on uh, dual antiplatelet therapy for one month before he came. So in my mind, I still have some reservations as to whether he had uh, um, a sort of issue with uh, uh, trichagalore. Uh, and uh, so that was another thing which we changed. After doing this, uh, we uh, changed him to prosugrel. Trichagalore resistance is uh, uh, very unusual, but not unheard of. I, I think people do talk of trichagalore resistance also. Uh, so that was another thing at the back of our mind, and we changed from trichagalore to prosugrel uh, with this final result. So this was our first presentation, thrombus in the left main. Um, I, I think uh, uh, the uh, cath lab in image intensifier uh, clearly shows this kind of thrombus, uh, though it is not uh, very well seen here. So this is after the um, first left main stent. We have probably missed the osseum. This is how he presented one month later. Uh, uh, he was taking all the tablets that he, we had given. So he was on uh, trichagalore, aspirin, and um, warfarin. And yet he had this uh, thrombus. And uh, this is after the second procedure where stent is going uh, beyond the circumflex origin into left, uh, into proximal LED. So uh, this is how we had a problem with the thrombus. Uh, any comments? Any? Uh... Hello, sir. Dr. Prabhakar, anyone for that yes, matter? Uh, sir, I just wanted to ask a few questions, sir. One thing, uh, we have seen similar cases uh, where we have this free-floating thrombus in uh, especially young people. And uh, we have given a type of an infusion in such cases and we had very good results with those. Uh, but yet there was some residual disease. Uh, is it uh, uh, good to stent those cases with that minimal plague or minimal residual disease which is there after tyrofibane infusion? That is one working in Ruby Hall, I would almost always do uh, uh, imaging on this. I think since it's an osteal lesion, probably IOS would be better than uh, OCT to image this. Uh, and that would tell us whether we have, in addition to thrombus, some kind of uh, um, uh, cuts in the left main. If that is there, uh, uh, I mean, we are talking of uh, Fisher versus... Uh, uh, Plaque rupture versus erosion. Rupture, yes. yes. Uh, uh, and uh, then if it is a rupture, of course, we like to stent. Um, uh, if there is no rupture on imaging, then this may be left unstented. But if it's left main, uh, I would really be very hesitant to do leave anything uh, just like that. And I, I should have 
I, I think we missed the Austrian metros, probably the biggest fault in this case. And uh, regarding, because I've seen many senior cardiologists uh, uh, putting these patients on uh, anticoagulation also, sir, along with antiplatelets. So he was on anticoagulation. He was on uh, trichagular aspirin plus warfarin. I mean, there is a big risk when you give these three together. And, uh, but then he was a very understanding uh, uh, gentleman. So we didn't mind giving him three anticoagulation. Though, of course, if he had had kind of any kind of bleed, he would have jumped at our throat. I mean, you should be ready for that. Yes. Uh, Dr. Prabhakar or Dr. Girish, any comments? On no, this? I think fantastic uh, case. And, uh, you know, it's a very uh, dangerous location. Uh, I feel, sir, we could have missed an ostium, but also it's so much thrombus burden. It's very difficult to be precise. And uh, why he stent failed could also be because of such large thrombus burden. And also, we are skeptical of doing thrombus aspiration in that location because oftentimes, a small dropping back of this into the iota can cause cerebral strokes. Uh, so oftentimes, uh, what I do is I just image once and if that is okay, I directly stent. Uh, at that time, in that location, long-term outcomes are secondary priority, but try to get the best... No, no. One minute, Dr. Girish. I mean, despite having a thrombus like this, you would do a direct stenting, correct? Yes. And you would expect the, the thrombus to risk. stay bet between the uh, uh, stent metal and, and the vessel wall and not distally embolize. No, the whole idea, sir, is the risk of stroke, because if you you know, the, all the thrombus aspiration trials, only drawback was the strokes, especially if it is something dangling in the ostium of the left vein. We are sure to embolize some amount where every time we fiddle something. So if it is distal embolization, I'm not concerned. But if it's a proximal embolization, we're worsening the patient. And that's what a young boy. Is the right catheter has to be very, very well aligned with the vessel. Like this is the lie of the uh, left main. Uh, the guide catheter has to be absolutely in line. I mean, the vessel Co coaxial. and the guide catheter should be absolutely coaxial. If that is correct, I think uh, your thrombus aspiration catheter uh, would do a good job. Also, uh, the back end should be on negative. So uh, a strong negative all the time, all the way out. I think if we do this, uh, we haven't had a single time we have faced a brain embolism uh, uh, during aspiration. Uh, I think we're very, this very is good. my collateral understanding from if there's a very proximal LED large thrombus burden, you start aspirating, invariably there is some chunk that goes into the circumflex. There is proximal migration of the thrombus and some fragmentation that goes down. So we're sure it may not have gone to the brain all the time, but there's always a risk, sir. So no, yes, point, I mean, we have one case where the thrombus went to circumflex. But yeah. uh, I think good negative, strong negative at the back end all the way out. I think so, the aspiration catheter comes out of the groin, I think maintain that negative. Because so many times you see a thrombus sticking to the tip of the aspiration catheter. Yes. As it is coming back into the guide catheter or going uh, through the groin, sh groin sheets, it can slip out. You know? So good negative is very, very important at this time. Very sure. Sir, actually, I, I have a lot of comments on this case. The point is the first time when you did the angiogram, you showed a very, very uh, thrombotic lesion there. This is the one. The first what? angiogram, the first, the other view that you showed looked like something was really hazy there. There was a real clear haziness. It could be most probably a thrombus. And what could be the cause without any other disease in any other place? It's just the isolated left main alone. The rest of the vessels are looking clean. So probably some kind of a dissection. Now you tried a thrombus aspiration, probably underlying dissection leading on to this kind of a problem. That's one. Actually, and this, this gentleman we... was playing football uh, when this happened. Uh, 
sir aap kya response whether that can uh, connect with what you are telling us so what i felt was uh, when dr girish discussed the case in the first point with you he said i was tented now was it sensible to wait on a left main thrombus such big thrombus with tarifuban and uh, tarifuban and heparin and uh, we can just plaster the thrombus with a good stent and you have a you have a gap between the bifurcation ostium and then go ahead and get it done we had an osteal miss but that that can happen to anywhere but you felt that at that point angiographically it looked good till the second uh, shot you took and then you, again you try to put another stent and then you did a high pressure inflation now if the stent had an osteal miss and you had a high pressure inflation so there is going to be a dissection proximally and uh, producing a thrombus that is going in and you have covered it beautifully with the triple uh, and triple anti thrombotics you're going to have warfarin also despite all the risks involved not recommended that much as a triple anti thrombotic and with the uh, aspirin ticagrelor and warfarin right? the risk of bleed is high but still he develops a thrombus so clearly there is a pharmacological failure or the second point is this is probably a dissection and there is an edge dissection at the distal end that we have missed because the thrombus is actually from the edge of the stent in the distal edge of the stent going into the lad so probably there was a distal edge dissection that led to a thrombus that is probably gone into the gone into the lad so there is definitely uh, this is what this is the view i was telling about sir so something really dancing there and uh, why not just get a wire into the circumflex lad just to take a stent and plaster the whole thing why wait for this and if he had gone in for an progression of the thrombus and no, no, this, this is when he has come back after one month okay um, there is no stent there so this i think this is the first one right this is first one yes sir because you see the thrombus there this is the first okay. one okay this is first one and that that's exactly the view the, the previous view was the one that i was talking about you have a small area take a floppy wire just get inside there get a stent directly stent it that's it so the lesson is left main never take a chance and don't take a chance because you would have lost take, it yeah i mean even if it is a thrombus the thrombus will get plastered between the stent and the vessel wall in this location yeah and uh, they we keep doing this i think i think we discussed in one of the other meetings go for a inflation and then deflate um, slowly so that you don't pull the thrombus by a sudden deflation come down on your deflation a little slowly not too fast left main it may be tricky but i think you have to probably get it done a little Even slowly even inflation and... also i think you can quickly go to about 4 but from 4 to maybe 25 or 30 go slow i think that is one way in which you don't disturb uh, the thrombus too much you know and deflation of course deflation going slow is not a issue it you can easily go slow on deflation and uh, the osteal lesion the other thing i felt was first time when you had the problem and you thought you had missed it you want to put a second stent in the ostium if you feel like doing it probably a floating wire in the left main would have probably guided you to to keep your keep a stent there in position maybe no, it's all retrospective thinking sir at that no, point no, but, uh, i think you have time to think uh, yes i think it's uh, you you can get a guide wire out of the guide catheter at and sinus. let a, let sinus. it loop at the sinus in the aortic sinus uh, out not enter into the vessel wall and that is how you can uh, exactly just the offshell position that is another point and i think the rest of it i think you have you have, you have demonstrated clearly but with a triple anticoagulation what do you think is the pathology is probably a distal dissection or where did the thrombus come from when the patient is on dual antiplatelet with warfarin uh, well i think uh, if he has resistance to tricagular Uh, that's a possibility i mean we don't generally have it i mean we don't generally think about it but i feel this was also a possibility now i totally agree with you that sir because resistance to prasugrel is le- le- pro- probably not known and probably the least among the three and uh, the choice of changing from ticagrelor to prasugrel i think was pretty obvious in this particular case so what is your uh, sort of a 100 cases you do how often you use uh, tricagrelor and how often you use prasugrel sir after the prag came i kind of literally shifted to prasugrel but the problem was availability of prasugrel i had one fellow who stopped prasugrel and he shifted back to the original uh, brand of uh, tricagrelor i thought it's better to, for the patient to take dual antiplatelet than so this guy stopped the uh, 
thing and came back to me luckily in two days. Then I realized that the availability of prasugural is a big problem. So then I moved it. Actually speaking, that is that is my only problem. Otherwise, after the Prague, I really... No, but there, are, there are so many Indian brands of prasugural available today. Uh, Not as freely available as ticket Gloss, sir. Is it? Definitely, mm -hmm. sir. At least here, I've had some a little bit of problem because um, ticket Gloss is so freely available and now that it has come down and off the price uh, thing and it's off the patent, uh, Ticagalor seems to be much more feeling. Even there, I prefer the original brand at least for the first three months when patients don't complain of the cost. And I tell them it's going to be for a short time. And sometimes push it to six months and then after that, it really doesn't matter much. In this case, actually, it's such a large stent and when you have a left main, thrombus there in the left main, within a stent, there has to be some problem like a distal dissection. I still feel that, unfortunately, we didn't have, we don't have an imaging to say that. But I think there must have been a problem there, the distal part, which... Well, not visible angiographically, I don't think. It's just it's just a guess, sir. Grace, yeah. sir, you're nodding yeah. your head. Go ahead. You unmute yourself and talk, sir. The, uh, the style guessing. in which we deploy the uh, left main stent is uh, deploy at maybe six to eight. Uh, bring the balloon back. So part of the balloon is hanging outside and go high on pressure. Uh, so we probably did that, and I don't know if you missed the ostium. It could probably hurt the ostium, and that could uh, be a, one of the reasons uh, why uh, it sort of uh, got into a thrombotic situation. But I think that the disease was more in the body mid and the distal part of it, isn't it, sir? More than the ostium of the... Uh, no, 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 no it was in the ostium. I will yeah. show I think you the first, the first the picture. First I think it shows the one on the left. I think shows uh, some kind of a osteal thing also. I I would didn't notice it initially, but but I th in that case, I think we'll have to call it as a pharmacological failure or probably a dissection there that is promoting a thrombus there. So we corrected both. I mean, we put an additional stent, and we change him from trachegalor to prosugra. Yeah, that's the best that can happen, young guy. Uh, but we still need to work on his, uh, uh, you know, said procoagulant state. And uh, we don't know if he had a dissection also there uh, or yeah. just the thrombus when you look yeah, at this, the angiogram. Uh, I mean, this is the view before the first stent went in. So it could be a dissection too. So left main, uh, see, it is so... I mean, one could have missed the uh, uh, thrombus in the uh, first. Uh, see, this is all that you see when you take a first picture. And caudal views. Yeah. <laughs> but then cool. this is the view which tells us that, yes, it is. Uh, I mean, yeah. I have never, I, I've rarely seen so much difference in two angles. But uh, I think, yes, we must understand why we take multiple views. Uh, the other point about hurting the uh, ostium of the stent, the stent, proximal part of the stent in the ostium, wherein you shed, you keep a wire on the balloon and go ahead with that. Uh, will it help if you inflate the balloon, push it on the on the balloon, like what we do with the guidezilla, and then get the guide catheter inside, sir? Yes. I think that, that would be more useful since you have a balloon there at the ostium. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Like push it along with that. I think it goes straight into the, without damaging the ostium of the... Yeah, that is what I showed in this uh, presentation too, that uh, with the wire and balloon inside, uh, you advance the uh, guide catheter towards the left main so that you're well inside a roomy left main. The guide catheter is floating well aligned with the... Uh, with the rest of the left wing. See, the greatest uh, challenge is rewiring without going between the stent struts and the wall. Uh, when we have covered the ostium of the stent, I mean ostium of the left main. And the bigger challenge is recrossing into the side branch through the center of the stents. I think that's where having this balloon in the left main and taking the guide into the middle of the left main and then take the second wire. I mean, that's how uh, it, it probably helps you to avoid go between the stent struts and the 
Russell Boyd. Great case. Plenty of them. Plenty of plenty of learning points. A lot of lot of new information. A lot of learning points. The failure of uh, why it developed a thrombus and how you can miss the ostium, how we could get the ostium, and then getting into these struts and then getting another stent inside, covering the whole thing. I, I, I think excellent case for discussion, sir. The uh, I always when I uh, suppose my fellow has started the case and taken some initial picture. When I go, uh, go and join him, I ask the nurse uh, if she has given uh, trichicle or two tablets. I don't ask the fellows because I think uh, it's the nurse's job. And so many times the fellows, they may or may not ask uh, whether uh, two tablets of uh, trichicle are given or no. So I think these are some issues I think which though we may be working at a higher level. You must make it a point to do it yourself. All right, Mr. Ravi, looks Please, like... Uh, yes, any, any other comments, yes. Dr. Prabhakar or Dr. Girish? Sir, actually, the other thing is if the time is short and when you are so thrombotic, Tikka is going to take time to act, about 30 to 40 minutes to act. You can probably give one bolus of tyrofoban there, just a bolus dose. I that think now we have Dr. Kangrilor. Yeah. So this we have made it available in the cat lab. The beauty of this is when you suspect a left main, a patient may go for a bypass surgery. Kangrilor, the yes. effect is just over the next one hour of stopping it. And we have it on the shelf these days. Uh, that's no, a no, great it, addition. It's that probably has less than us. one hour also. Like you stop Kangrilor, the action is steeply down. So in the next few minutes, the Absolutely. action is gone completely. So I think this so that's is a great really addition. Uh, yes, I think we must think of it. And another thing, what I uh, what has been my priority is loading on the table. I think is more documented than Taika Villa. So if I have not given a bolus and then I decide to do an ad hoc and load the second antiplatelet, I always prefer Rasugrel than Taika Villa because the why? Studies are on the cat lab. I think that's what the European guidelines are also said. On table loading, I think, has to be possible. No, why the action is quicker than uh, trichicular or? One, it's quicker, sir, and the data is more in favor of possible. The European guideline on uh, um, ACS in uh, NSTEMI came up and said that if you're going to load there, the immediate data is better with the uh, prasugrel. So you continue with prasugrel afterwards? You continue with prasugrel, sir. Yes. Oh, that's the news to me. I did not know that um, uh, immediate uh, use is better with prasugrel. Are you because the, when we compare the ticaglar and uh, prasugrel, the clinical trials, the prasugrel was mostly given on table, sir, not in the ER. And ticaglar was given in the ER. So when you look at that, I think we should, if you extrapolate that uh, data, on the table, I think pras uh, prasugrel looks much superior to ticaglar. No, but it's so easy for us, like a patient who is not on any antiplatelet and he's with you. You right. do an angiogram. So some patients you give... Uh, uh, trichicolor and measure uh, platelet inhibition percentage at the end of say one hour or half hour and do the same with uh, uh, prasugrel. prasugrel and sure. that will tell us whether action is quickly on or no. Mr. Ravi, you have anything uh, from, on this issue since uh, it is the onset of action that we are talking uh, no, sir. There is no comment from any uh, delegates so far, sir. All right. We'll call it a day and um, uh, close today's session. Thank you all for joining us. And Thank you. Uh, again, uh, MCURE plays a very crucial role in bringing all of us together on these uh, uh, exciting meetings. Thank you, Ravi. Tell all your yeah. colleagues that we are really, really obliged.
thank thank you thank you sir thank you so much thank it was really you. a fantastic day today sir because you know we witnessed almost a uh, 4 million 70 minutes was present today and uh, you know it was very uh, nice his presentation done by dr sajid kishan as well as dr agarwal thank you so much uh, both of them and also thank you for a very unique and interesting case that will be definitely be very important later so again thanks to our moderator dr varma kasri and dr grace sir for joining us today Once again, thank you, sir, for this event. Thank you, sir. Good day, sir. Hey, Karthi, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Good night, sir. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night.